On behalf of Spokane Community College and the Hagen Center for the Humanities, I would like to welcome all of you. We invite you collectively to sit down together, all of us at the same table at the same time to engage in dialogue about race, about diversity, about equity. I am Stacey Koutko, our resident historian here at Spokane Community College, and I will be your host this evening. We encourage audience participation. If you would like to ask questions of our guests this, <clears throat> excuse me, this evening, please type them into the comments. And if you are not logged into social media, you can email your questions to scc.hagencenter at scc.spokane.edu, scc dot h a g a n c e n t e r at scc dot spokane dot edu. Our moderators will forward these questions to me, and I will make sure we get to ask our quest our guests as many of those questions as we can. We are honored to acknowledge that the community colleges of Spokane and our main campuses for Spokane Falls and Spokane Community College are located on the traditional and sacred homelands of the Spokane tribe. We also provide services in the region that includes the traditional and sacred homelands of the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation and the Kalispell Tribe. We pay, pay our respect to tribal elders, both past and present, as well as to all indigenous people today. This land holds their cultural DNA, and we are honored and grateful to be here on their traditional land. We give thanks to the legacy of the original peoples and their descendants and pledge to honor their stewardship and values. On for a little bit of information about our speaker. Jod Abumrad is the creator and former host of Radio Lab, a public radio program broadcast on nearly 600 stations across the nation and downloaded more than 12 million times a month as a podcast. Abumrad currently hosts Everything Together Radio on Apple Music Hits, with each episode offering a kaleidoscope of music, a tempo, electro, dance, funk, hip hop, experimental noise, soul, and everything in between. <coughs> Jod, <coughs> excuse me. Jod Abumrad employs his dual backgrounds as composer and journalist to create what's been called a new aesthetic in broadcast journalism. He orchestrates dialogue, music, interviews, and sound into compelling documentaries that draw listeners into investigations of otherwise intimidating topics. For example, the nature of numbers, the evolution of altruism, the legal foundation of the war on terror. He's won three George Foster Peabody Awards and in 2011, Abumrad was honored as a MacArthur Fellow, also known as the Genius Grant. The MacArthur Foundation website says, Abumrad is an inspiring, boundless curiosity within a generation of listeners and experimenting with sound to find ever more effective and entertaining ways to explain ideas and tell a story. John also created and hosted three seasons of More Perfect, a series focused on untold stories of the Supreme Court in which the New York Times called possibly the most mesmerizing podcast. In 2019, John created Dolly Parton's America along with OSM Audio Shima Oliai a Peabody award-winning nine-part series that explores a divided America through the life and music of one of its greatest icons. In April of 2022, Jod began a joint appointment at Vanderbilt University as a distinguished research professor, professor of cinema and media arts and of communication science and technology with the College of Arts and Science. With an advisory role with Vanderbilt's communications and marketing team thrown in, please joining Please join me in welcoming Jod Appenrod. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me and for that Thank lovely introduction. Thank you for being here with us. <laughs> Just so our audience knows, there was a little bit of traffic, so we did get held up in our start. Um, but we are here for an amazing conversation, and so let's get started. Um, if you would, please, get, would you give our listener, our watchers, <laughs> Um, going with the podcast bit, would you um, provide our watchers with a little bit of background in Radio Lab and where that inspiration came from? Yeah, I mean, it's almost hard to it's almost hard to think back because it 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 uh, it came about in a very uh, particular historical window where uh, this was 2002, uh, tw almost 20 years ago. Uh, 
you know, there was public radio, which at that time there was no podcasting. So at that time it was, um, there was, there was this American life, which was sort of the, the one place that was doing kind of really cinematic non narrated or nonfiction or, or, or uh, deeply narrative stuff. And then there was like news radio. And so those were the two things happening. Uh, and that was basically it. Uh, it was a very different media landscape, podcast landscape, uh, than than there is now and i sort of stumbled into it through the side door i was a musician uh, who was really interested in 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 radio uh, so i started volunteering and eventually ended up working at um uh the w the wnyc then the npr station in new york and um you know at the time uh, they were looking to experiment and to this was sort of post 9 11 that everybody wanted to change their airwaves to invite new voices and new uh new sounds and new forms and i happened to be standing in the hall at at the moment that decision was made for new york so i started a show called radio lab uh probably long before i deserved to um and uh at, you know it was it was uh it, it evolved very quickly to be kind of a uh take a big idea in science or philosophy and explore it through a combination of storytelling, through talking to experts, through looking at history, speaking to historians like yourself, uh, just like uh, mashing up a lot of different ways of thinking into one kind of like kaleidoscopic joyride over the course of an hour. And each hour would have a different theme, you know? And so some of those early ones were time and consciousness. Um, and we would explore it through what science could teach us, but also look at it in more of a humani humanities kind of way. And um, the show initially was only five or six a year. So it was just like specials really. But, you know, over the course of three or four years, we really gained an audience and then we started making more. And uh, by around 2009, it was um, starting to get on other radio stations and, and the rest is kind of history. And, you know, along the way, podcasting became a thing and we became one of the first big podcasts. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, as I look back on it, it's a very strange kind of standing in the right place at the right time kind of story. Um, yes, so that's it. That's sorry, those are a rambling answer, but that's basically what Radio Lab is. That's why we asked. <laughs> um, from a, um, and I, in talking with some colleagues and some people who I know are attending tonight, um, some of the conversation was revolving around the different questions that, that have been answered through Radio Lab. Um, and one of the things we were taught, in your opinion, we were talking about what we think were different because a lot of these are used in our classes for assignments, for extra credits. We use this kind of stuff quite frequently. Um, I realized that that's a lot of radio lab to talk about what, but what in your mind are some of the most important things radio lab has addressed? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say there's one question, right? Uh, I, what I would say that it's a particular attitude that I feel like we carry through everything. Um, it's this idea that there's no one way to know things, you know? Um, I mean, the fancy word would be epistemology, right? The, the, there's no one not way of no, like, it's sort of that famous quote, knowledge is only one way of knowing. I, I feel like we take that to heart. And so even when we, investigate let's say um the evolution of altruism and, and and we're talking to evolutionary biologists we still then look we still then pivot and let's hear from a poet let's hear from uh from uh a person who who's just living their life getting their coat on walking out the door and something happened uh and, and so for for me it's always this one of the most important things i think we do is is that it's like there's no there's never a sense that um that there's a that there's a, that there's one way of thinking that has a monopoly on the truth and that for me is a deeply important kind of core ingredient to every story that we tell we always approach each of these stories with like great humility and um and we sort of expect that of each person we interview we go to people who are really smart but we never sort of take what they say as the gospel, you know, it's always one way of knowing. And every time reality tilts, it shows you a new, a new, um, 
a new vision of something you didn't know. Um, and then the other thing I would say about Radiolab, which, uh, which I feel like is really key is, uh, you know, it was one of the first shows where you had two hosts bickering and bantering, uh, which is such a funny thing to say, because it's such a commonplace thing now. Um, but for me, one of the key ingredients of, of, of Radiolab, and I think specifically of my time with Robert Krolwich, uh, who I really, in, in a lot of ways, started the show with, is that it, it, there was a sense of just the animal spirits of the thing were just like he and I liked each other. We had a really good time with each other. And like I think a lot of the people who came to the show, you know, there's something about like when you really are enjoying someone and, and you're enjoying and you're having, you're like, you're very interested in what they think. You don't agree with them and you argue, but you're, you're curious about, about the differences between you. I think there's something infectious about that and it draws people to you. And, uh, and so I think that's a key ingredient too. So those are, those are two things I would say. Not so much the questions, but the thing that's on behind the questions. What, um, another, in, that, in the same conversation I was having earlier, another thing we were, were talking about is, is, you know, what questions are continuing to be explored? In your opinion, what are, what are one or two questions we, need, we as a society, we as a people need to dig into deeper? I think we, I think there's a, let's see, that's a great question. I mean, I, 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 I think there's a question about how to, I mean, like there's a whole, there's a whole, I'll, I'll answer it personally. Like I've been doing a lot of interviews uh, for my own sort of edification right now about um, to a lot and, and to a lot of people who just, who, who research how to talk to people, how to, how to have conversations uh, and there's a whole community of thinkers and social scientists who 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 study discourse ethics and like how do you talk when you have somebody that you don't agree with and how do you what are what are the ways in which we can have those conversations um, and not kill each other not hate each other um, what are some of the simple rules that we can put in place and so for me there is actually a question looming now it's almost like the it's a, it's not even the question. It's the foundation upon which any good question can rest, which is how do you how do you how do you communicate across difference? You know, that feels to me like a very key um, question that's being asked uh, about uh, across race, across class, uh, across the generations, um, life experience. You know, I mean, there's a way in which. I worry that we are, we're getting to be a kind of a noisy room, you know, and no one is sort of, I, I want somebody to say, okay, everybody, let's just like agree to a few basic things. And now, now we can talk. So uh, I'm striving for the, what's the best way to even have a, a conversation where you can be curious about someone, you know, um, that and climate change, <laughs> frankly, those are the two things. I mean, you know, that's sort of the thing that rests behind all of it, I guess. But uh, yeah, how to how to talk to a human, and how to escape the reality that the planet is on fire. Those are some big questions that we yeah. need to address as a people. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to lighten it up for a little bit, um, in reading, I haven't listened to all of the Radio Lab podcast, um, but I've listened to quite a few, and I've heard some really interesting questions come through. What are some of the oddest questions in your memory, in your experience that you've addressed? Like just the weirdest yeah. stuff. Well, I mean, one of the ones that jumps to mind immediately is uh, we, this would be maybe five, six years ago, we were doing a show about color and uh, which is already kind of a weird decision to do an audio show where you can't see anything about color. It's like, it's almost impossible to describe colors. Um, but we decided to do it. And in the middle of a conversation about the vision systems of various creatures, we were talking to a biologist about this. Robert asked a question. Um, like, and it, it, I remember he just sort of threw it out. He said, suppose you had like a bunch of creatures huddled together looking at the same rainbow. Like you had a cow, a sparrow, a uh, octopus. And uh, I don't know, a zebra. And they're all together looking at a rainbow. Who sees the best rainbow? 
um, because all of these different creatures have different visual systems and they have different numbers of rods and cones in their eyes. So who's like the champion rainbow seer? And uh, that turned into an utterly hilarious segment where we had, like, you can't, it turns out, so it turns out the, the answer is the, uh, the mighty mantis shrimp. It's a, it's a, it's a shrimp about this big. Uh, it, it, it's, they're violent little bastards. They like, they kill, like they, they have these huge, like these little plunger arms under their bodies and they just like whip their arms and just like kill things all day long. Um, but they have these incredible eyes that like these little cartoon eyes that hang off the top of their head. And inside each of those eyeballs is 16 rods and cones. And we have three as humans and they have 16. So they can see like infrared, they can see ultraviolets, they can see all of these gradations of colors in the rainbow. So their rainbow must be like, like they must just see the best rainbow ever. So we ended up trying to kind of evoke this in sound by we got a choir together, 120 voice choir uh, in a church in 33rd and uh, 8th. And we assigned different frequencies of the color spectrum to different voices in the choir. And so each creature that we were talking about, we would then harmonize, quote unquote, to say, this is what a dog rainbow would sound like. And you hear like a few voices and then it would grow to a sparrow and then it would grow to the mantis strip. Um, so that's like a weird, uh, that's the, uh, the one of the weird questions that you get into if you just like, if you start kind of poking at things, you uh, you suddenly wonder what a man like what a rainbow would look like to a mantis shrimp, and then how could you even see like we couldn't even see that because we only have three. So how how can you see it in your mind? And then that's where that's where yeah. So that 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 one comes to mind. That is a fantastically odd question. <laughs> I want to share a couple of comments from our audience, especially because they relate to Radio Lab. Um, one of our one of our current viewers, Bonnie, wanted us to let you know that Radio Lab, one of the greatest programs of all time, super appreciative of your role in creating it and then making sure it would sustain. And uh, Bonnie wanted us to pass along the love from Thank you, Bonnie. your fans that means here a lot. in Spokane. Um, and Bonnie followed it up with a question. Over the years of your career, have you grown, and all of your experiences in all of these different arenas, have you grown more or less hopeful about the future of humanity and why? That's a, uh, that's a really good question, Bonnie. Um, you know, it oscillates for me. Um, I think probably like every, like everyone right now uh, on Monday, I'll feel utterly hopeless depending on what happened in the news cycle. But then on Tuesday, I feel a sense of possibility. Um, and I also know that, I mean, one of the great, I mean, you must know this as a historian, right? Like one of the great things about studying history is that you realize that if moments that feel singular are not, there were other times in history that were just as bad, if not worse. Um, there were plagues in history that were infinitely worse than the plague that we're sort of in the long tail of. Um, that's a thought which gives it, which gives me some hope. It lets me know we've been here before. We can solve things. Um, you know, I my it's funny. My this is gonna, this is a strange kind of uh, digression, but it'll make sense. Like my grandfather, uh, I, I was just researching this story. He when he was ten. And uh, it, it, the only way that they can make ends meet in Lebanon, this is during the Great Famine of Lebanon, where half the country died. And this is back in World War One. They would march 35 uh, uh, miles in one direction, him and his mother, and they would sell produce from their village to the German army that was occupying the country. And they'd march 35 miles the other direction and sell the um, things they got from the German army to the Allied forces. And they would trade things between enemies. And that's how they made ends meet. And then one day they're making this trek and his mom, my great grandma, just dies on the side of the road. And as a 10 year old boy, he had to bury her on the side of the road and keep walking. Um, and I think about that kid, right? Like he was a 10 year old kid looking into a horrible, hopeless void, but he kept walking and uh, he you know, ended up having a family of his own, one of whom was my dad. And he forced my dad to go to college 
where he met my mom and then they came to America and had me and everything that I am like this conversation would, would not exist. I would not exist were it not for that kid who refused to be hopeless in some way. And so I think about him and I'm like, I, I don't have, I, I, I have an amazing life. I don't have, I don't have any excuse to be hopeless. Do you know what I mean? And so there's a way in which I, I sort of draw on the past a lot when, when I am feeling hopeless. It's really easy to feel hopeless right now uh, with some of the things that are happening. Uh, but I know that that's too easy. I know that that's, and so I don't, I don't let myself go there. And I think, all right, come on, grandpa, let's do this. You know? So then, yeah. Um, it's harder to keep that, to keep that feeling, but, uh, but I feel like it's more important than ever. Another big fan, Jonathan, who is watching currently sends a question of all of the episodes of radio lab that you have done over the years. Which do you feel had the largest impact on our collective conscience? Man, that's a tough question. That's a great question. I'm going to answer an adjacent question because I don't know is the short answer. I have no idea what episode we've done that um, has has shifted the conversation. Um, you know, we've done some investigative ones for some really big ones that created conversations that weren't there before, but maybe, maybe I'll answer it personally. You know, I mean, there, there were times like, you know, one of the stories we did that I just, I, 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 that haunts me personally. I don't know if it's changed the culture really, but um, we got, we got into a story about the role of war photography uh, throughout the ages in America, right? Um, and the story begins with a, an incredible photographer, Lindsay Dario, embedded in Afghanistan with a medevac unit. 18 year old kid is brought in. He's just stepped on a landmine and, um, she documents the final moments of this kid's life as these, as these doctors and, uh, and nurses are trying to save his life. She wants to put these pictures in the newspaper. Uh, time wanted her to do that because there is this thing that has happened over the years. You know, you think about uh, Vietnam, the, there were pictures, that we, uh, people came back and brought us pictures of what was happening and that changed the conversation. Those pictures were hard to look at, but then we were involved, we were implicated. And so then we, we had a national conversation about what, what are we doing over there? Since then, the government has outlawed showing the you can't show a picture of a dead body. Like there are some things that, that the government has really clamped down on. And so as a consequence, we as a culture, we can be at war and not really feel it. You know, like our lives don't change that much, but there are people out there. Who, and, and so Lindsay wanted to put those pictures in the magazine to say, look, this is what this war really is. Um, but they needed permission from the father of the kid. And he said, I don't want those pictures in the in the magazine and he has every right as the as the boy's son so i went i went and visited that that man and i sat with him on his couch and he sh he pulled out this manila envelope and took out these pictures um and these are hard pictures these are pictures of like a kid with who's wide open and his organs are like it's just it's really hard to look at um, but I remember just the tenderness with which this father was looking at these pictures of his son in his final moments. And I, I just remember feeling like, wow, I'll never be the same after this. You know, there's some way in which like you have these, like this, the, this, this gift that the mic gives you, it allows you to go into someone else's reality and speak to them and for them to share the most intimate, difficult things with you. Um, it changes you, you know? And like, there are times I've had a few experiences like that where I just, uh, I, I know, I, I know it's changed me, you know, I can't say what it's, what it's done to anyone else who's listening, but for me, like the, I think of that moment. Jonathan did follow up, um, with one of the episodes that impacted him the most. So I want to share that comment with you. Thank you for answering dad. I will say 
the episode you did on the unlikely bone marrow donation that led to a clashing of ideals inspired me to join the registry. Everyone should give that one a listen. Yeah, that <laughs> one actually, uh, that one, that one, that one did reach a few people. That one did reach. We heard that there are many, many people who had that same reaction, which is amazing. So thank you, Jonathan. And I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. Um, I'm going to transition a little, especially with my own historian interest, into more perfect. Um, could you talk a little bit about the inspiration for that pro behind that project? You know, the inspiration was really pretty simple, which was um, one day I was reading the paper and um, it happened to be the day that the Supreme Court released its upcoming docket. So what the Supreme Court does is early in the year, they'll say, we're going to see these cases. And they won't tell you what they're going to do to the cases, but they're going to see them. So they, they basically said, these are the, these are the cases that are going to come to our party. And they had a list of these cases. And I remember reading all of these cases and being like, I don't know the first thing about any of this stuff. I don't even know what the Supreme Court does. Who's on the Supreme Court? What, 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 what do you, what kind of, what do you do there? How does that affect me? I just remember having the, all of these questions and like, wow, I think I've missed that day in school. I didn't, no one, had, no one explained to me, like, who are these people? And like, did, I never elected them. How'd they get there? You know? So I just had all these basic questions about, about these people and then those specific cases. So what I did um, is I assigned everybody on the team. We have about 20, well, at the time less, probably about 10 at the time, but these days, 20 reporters who work at Radio Lab. And I, uh, I asked each person on the staff to pick a case, make three phone calls, and then report back. And so uh, they did. So we were gathered the next week. And everybody said, okay, here's this case. This is what I found out. And one of the, our reporters, this guy named Tim Howard, found this incredible story uh, about a case called Adoptive Couple v. Baby Girl. And it was essentially a, a custody battle, two different parties fighting over a two-year-old girl. But somehow the sovereign status of 500 different um native sovereign nations hinged on the outcome of this one case uh, in, in a way that would be too complicated for me to even explain to you, but it completely fascinating. And as a historian, you would, I mean, there, you would, it, it, it revealed this incredible history of the abduction of young children from uh, native reservations, which I didn't even know a thing about. And I just remember that it was this amazing story where it was just like one little girl and then all of these existential questions hinging on her. And I was like, oh my God, this is what I want in every story. Like you want a character going through a thing, someone you can relate to, and you wanna be able to see all the sides of the situation that they find themselves in. And then you want it to matter, you want it to have stakes. And so it was just a, such a good story that we just were like, let's do that again. And then, um, and we kept doing it. And then eventually um, we made a show called More Perfect that did it, that did nothing but that, you know, just looked at these really important consequential cases. Um, and uh, we did four or three seasons of More Perfect. Um, and then, you know, it's got, it went away for a while, uh, but there's a, it might be coming back. I don't want to say anything. Not it, it maybe it'll be a different cast of characters doing it, but but uh, there's a yeah there's a good uh, it's the it, it's life it it still has an adolescence to live that 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 show. Well, we won't push, but we will keep an eye out because it is a fascinating for anyone who's watching who hasn't checked it out. Um, riveting. If you could pick something to teach every United States citizen or person who wants to become a United States citizen, lump all of that together, what would you teach about SCOTUS? What would you teach about the Supreme Court of the United States that civilians, citizens really need to know? Hmm, about the Supreme Court, I think what I would teach, Huh, that's a great question. I think what I would teach is, um, I wanna give you a specific answer. 
I would probably choose one case. Maybe it's, maybe it is, maybe it's a political thicket or uh, maybe Dred Scott. I would take one of the big ones, you know? Um, I, I think what I would do is I'd probably take a case like Dred Scott, um, which uh, I'm going to say this quite wrong because I'm, 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 I can't summon the exact facts of that case. But that's a, that's a case that basically um, upheld upheld a like legally upheld bondage of another human being, right? So um, not one of our finest moments, right? No. Um, but I think that's kind of the point is that uh, you, you look at a case like Dred Scott and you, you really examine the arguments that were made on both sides. And like the people making these arguments, even the people making the arguments that were on the wrong side of history, um, they weren't stupid. You know, they were making legally, to what to them were legally sound arguments. And it is interesting to me when you see imperfect humans making making arguments um like something about that i think says it all for me like that there's a the law is our aspiration to it's a promise to our future selves to be better than we actually are in a way and a lot of times if you look at the supreme court you realize we're, we're not we're so not there yet you know and um and there's something um, humbling about that to me, uh, but there's also something in the very baked into the very institution, into the way in which two people can come and argue to the best of their abilities and try and influence the direction of this country. Like there's something that's also a bit hopeful in that as well, even when you look at a horrible, horrible case like Dred Scott. So I don't know. I guess I would look at a case if I were going to teach kids, and I would sort of. I would ask them to examine it, the arguments on either side and do their best to really make the best version of each of those arguments. And then to explain to themselves why this side won or that side won. And sometimes the arguments will be noble because the law, the law says one thing and another. And sometimes it's just because this person, this human being was an asshole and we, we, we excuse my language. And, uh, and, uh, we weren't good enough to call them on it at that point. So sometimes it's about human failings as well. So uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm just saying a whole bunch of words, but, uh, but I, I think that's what I would say. I think that's what I would do. It is a fascinating series. <laughs> so all of those words made perfect sense to me. Um, I want to transition because um, we have a couple of questions about Dolly Parton's America and ask you to speak to the inspiration behind the background to the evolution of that project, please. Sure, sure. Um, uh, so the, you know, Do Dolly Parton. It's a it's a, it's a funny story. Um, it's a combination of growing up in the South. I grew up in Nashville. Dolly is the patron saint of Nashville. She's on every billboard. Um, but also, just a, a strange twist of fate. My uh, my father, who is a doctor ended up being on call the day that Dolly got into a minor car accident in Nashville and was brought into Vanderbilt. And he ended up being the person um, to help her in that moment. And they inexplicably struck up a friendship. Uh, and, and my dad is not that kind of guy. He's just like a, he's just a guy, you know, <laughs> he doesn't hang out with famous people, but uh, they ended up being friends. And then for a minute he was her doctor and then they just were friends and I, you know, I, I always knew this about him, but I didn't really believe it. And one day in 2016, I remember this was a moment when um, the political discourse was like a dumpster fire. Um, hasn't really improved much, but uh, it was a really bad moment where you had Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton running for office and they were just hurling like flaming piles of dung at each other. And um and I remember at the same time, Dolly was on tour and she came through New York. And I remember the reaction of everybody at my office. They were losing their mind, so excited to go see Dolly Parton. And it was really weird to me. I thought, oh, I didn't realize New Yorkers liked Dolly. It's such a dumb thing to think, but that's literally what I thought. I was like, I thought she was just a Nashville thing. And uh, anyhow, it was seeing all of these like godless liberals like going to see Dolly Parton that uh, just got me interested. I was like, wow, what's going, how is it that she's so pow powerfully important to where I grew up and then also here where I'm now living? 
so then I called my dad and I was like, dad, do you really know Dolly Parton? Um, and he, he, we, I got on a plane and, and she was nice enough to sit down for an interview. I mean, probably more as a favor to him than to, than to me. And, uh, and that's how it started. And I just kept going back and asking him more questions. And then it turned from a three episode series into 12 and then into, into beyond. So, um, yeah, it was really just, it was really a way for me to look back on what the place I came from and also to look at this incredible icon and to see how she can somehow thread the needle and speak to everyone at once, you know? She absolutely does. I'm yeah. from the South originally as well in Louisiana. Okay. And there you go. She has such a presence. <laughs> Just yeah, she, a presence. it's really extraordinary. Um, as someone's knocking at the door, so I should probably go in about a minute, but, but, yeah, um, but, uh, yes, over to you. Um, uh, since someone is knocking at the door, um, let's ask a closing question for the night Okay. for you, um, in your perspective, what has been one of the most, one of the best silver linings of this pandemic experience? in your life people are starting to talk about silver linings more and more yeah and yeah. things they want to keep and perpetuate what what has been beneficial for you oh that's a great question um you know i mean i i think maybe it's uh i think like so many people i have had the experience of stepping back and just looking at how i who i am and how i've been living and just thinking oh, well is that you know, what of that, what, what of my habits and patterns do I want to carry forward? What do I just want to let go of? And I've had that kind of like personal reckoning. Um, it's one of the many reasons uh, I decided to move on from Radio Lab. Not that I, I have, I have just incredible amount of love for the show and for those people, but um, for what it was demanding of me, I felt like I needed to make a change and uh and you know particularly for my my family and like if there's a silver lining for me about the pandemic it's been i've been at home a lot more and i i just have a, a much deeper sense of my children you know like i mean i've you know i've always been close to the, to the kids but like now i know exactly like i know their how they rise and fall through the day i know that my 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 oldest Emil, like you don't really talk to him in the morning, you know. But then at night he gets a little bit spazzy, and that's when he's like really you know eff effusive and expansive, and that's when you can ask him all the questions you want to ask. Whereas my youngest, I know it's the opposite, right? So I've just gotten to know them and just like they're how they how they move in a way, uh, which and that's been a real gift. I've really really loved that. Um, and it's, 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 uh, as, as things are tiptoeing back to normal, whatever that means, that's the thing I don't want to give up. That's a fantastic silver lining. Thank you so much for your time, for your contribution to our educational efforts over here in Spokane, Washington, and for having such a fantastic conversation with us tonight, Dad. We so appreciate it. And thank you guys for uh, for for the invitation and for tolerating my my traffic jams and all that. Yeah, it's been a, it's been really lovely. Thank you so much. Have a great great evening. You too. Goodbye. Good night, everybody. <laughs>